I apologize for my voice tonight. I have this allergy that hits me every single year for the past uh, 40 years anyway. And so we'll see how far we get tonight. We're looking at the uselessness of unscrewing the inscrutable tonight as we look at the book of Job once again. I could not help but think as Steve was singing that song tonight, speaking about the broken heart of God. If you can only imagine, here God creates a perfect world. He creates an incredible, vast universe out there. He gives to mankind in the Garden of Eden a wonderful paradise to love, to enjoy, to have everything in the world that Adam and Eve could have ever hoped for. And yet, in that very beginning of time, Satan, the usurper, creeps in and changes the whole destiny uh, because of sin that fell in the Garden of Eden. As you and I study the book of Job, <clears throat> essentially, the book of Job is really not only a study about this man called Job, but it's a, it's a study of God himself. When you think about it, <clears throat> first of all, it was God who first met with Satan and struck this deal that regarded Job's life. Secondly, it was God who released the adversary in order to go after Job. Thirdly, it was God who set the boundaries placing limitations on every attack. Fourthly, it was God who permitted all of it to happen from start to finish. Fifthly, it was God, as we will see in a later chapter, who broke the silence and spoke to Job. And it was God who would finally set the record straight. He would rebuke the sorry friends who thought they were great counselors and he would reward his faithful servant Job. And all the way through the book of Job, God, <clears throat> who captures our attention and makes us wonder, maybe better stated, oftentimes we are even more confused because of the various things that happen in this man's life. Uh, <clears throat> you and I probably grew up at a period of time, I know I did, grew up in a church where we learned early on that God is good, God is loving, God is merciful, God is compassionate, God is just, God is fair, God is holy, God is full of mercy, God is filled with grace. He <clears throat> sympathizes with our weaknesses that we have in life according to Hebrews 4. Verse 15, he knows what you and I need before we ever ask him, as Matthew 6, 8 tells us, and he satisfies your years with good things, according to the psalmist in the 103rd Psalm, verse 5. Do you remember the uh, little mealtime prayer that we prayed or we taught our children to pray? God is great, God is good. Let us thank him for our food. Amen. And then, with all that being said, then you and I encounter a man by the name of Job. And we see God stepping back into the shadows. He permits Satan to afflict this godly servant as God stays silent and he keeps a distance. And he refuses to answer when Job pleads for an explanation. I'll go ahead and say it. It seems pretty cruel, doesn't it? I mean, if you and I really are honest, it really seems to be a cruelty here. If not cruel, it's certainly in conflict with the God we met as children in vacation Bible school and Sunday school. So you and I are left with one of two conclusions. Either we weren't given a complete and a correct understanding of our God, or we do not really understand this st story about Job's life. I believe the former is really the truth. We, the picture we were given as children in Sunday school is somewhat of an incomplete picture, and by that I'm speaking about 
when Paul wrote a brief yet profound statement regarding the Lord our God in the book of Romans chapter 11, 33, I want you to just pause and think about this scripture. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. Now, whenever you really think about that and what that entails, the word unsearchable, the word unfathomable there. Let, let me go back to a time when the Apostle Paul in first century Christianity, <coughs> he penned his letter to the Romans, ultimately to you and me, that God is unfathomable, that God is unsearchable. Now, don't misunderstand, that doesn't mean that he stops being good. It doesn't mean he's no longer loving and merciful. He's still all of that, but God is so much more than all of that. God is incredibly incomprehensible. He's deep. His ways are beyond our understanding and seemingly the mysterious. And those things are that are inexplicable to you and to me. The longer we think on this, the more you and I realize there's a lot about God that we were never taught. And in the midst of this study of the book of Job, we're forced to dig much deeper into his character, to discover a lot of depths there. In a word, we could say God is inscrutable. You and I can search. We can look. We can listen, we can read, we can comprehend all the things that we do understand about God, and yet there is so much more about God that you and I could never, ever comprehend in this life. He is the infinite God. You and I are the uh, finite that he has created, and therefore there are just some things that you and I will never understand. Dr. Uh, John Walvoord, who was uh, formerly a professor uh, in the uh, Dallas Theological School there, uh, he told a graduating class one day, he quoted from Romans 11:33, and looking around the campus chapel, he added with a smile, there will be times, he said, you will try to unscrew the inscrutable. There will be times you will try to unscrew the inscrutable. In other words, you cannot do that. As usual, I believe Dr. Walvoord is right. I believe that there are so many things in life that you and I try to explain. Have you ever noticed that we have to explain everything? I mean, you and I live in a world today that is filled with technology, filled with scientific discoveries, and, and so we have been conditioned in the world that you and I live in, that we grow up in, that we are educated in. We just assume that there has to be an answer for everything and we're always trying to come up with that great important answer. But I want you to notice what Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 and 9 has to say. God is speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Aren't you grateful sometimes that your thoughts are not his thoughts? He said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You see, you and I will struggle through life, trying to answer all kinds of questions that we have no answers for. Oh, we'll give some flimsy answer that really wouldn't hold water whatsoever. But because we have been conditioned in the world that we live in to always come up with an answer, there's got to be an answer. And so, in assuming that, even in our own limited and our finite way, we are so small we are so small. We sing about God. We sing about creation. We sing about his heaven. I read in one of Chuck Swindoll's books this, and I want to share this with you tonight about the imaginary journey out there in outer space and trying 
to understand the enormity of who God is. You and I try as best we can. He says in this particular article, if it were possible to travel the speed of light, you could arrive at the moon in one and a third seconds. But continuing at that same speed, do you know how long it would take you to reach the closest star? Four years. New York City's Hayden Planetarium has a miniature replica of our solar system. It shows the speeds and the sizes of our planets. What's interesting is that the three outer planets are not even included. These, there weren't room for Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. Uranus would be in the planetarium's outer corridor. Neptune would be around 8th Avenue. And Pluto, another three long avenues away at 5th Avenue. By the way, no stars included for obvious reasons. Can you imagine on the same scale where the nearest star would be located? Cleveland, Ohio. And remember, that's just only our local galaxy. A scientist once suggested another interesting analogy. He said, to grasp the scene, imagine a perfectly smooth glass pavement on which the finest speck can be seen and then shrink our sun from 865,000 miles in diameter. You remember that from science, diameter, the distance through? From 865,000 miles in diameter, if you shrunk that to only two feet and then place the ball on the pavement to represent the sun. <coughs> he said, step off 82 paces, about two feet per pace, and to represent proportionately the first planet, Mercury. Put down a tiny mustard seed. And then take 60 steps more and for Venus, put down a, just a plain ordinary BB. Mark 78 more steps and put down a green P that would represent the earth. Step off 108 paces from there and from Mars, put down a pinhead. Sprinkle around some fine dust for the asteroids and then take 788 steps more and place an orange on the glass for Jupiter. After 934 more steps, put down a golf ball for Saturn. And then now it gets really involved. Mark off 2,086 steps more and for Uranus, a marble. Another 2,322 steps. From there you would arrive at Neptune. Let a cherry represent Neptune. This will take two and a half miles. And we haven't even discussed Pluto. We have a smooth glass surface five miles in diameter yet just a tiny fraction of the heavens, excluding Pluto. Now guess how far we'd have to go on the same scale before we could put down another two-foot ball to represent the nearest star. We'd have to go 6,720 miles before we could arrive at that star. Miles, not feet. And that's just the first star among millions in one galaxy among hundreds, maybe thousands, and all of it in perpetual motion, perfectly synchronized the most accurate timepiece that's known to man. You know, it amazes me when I <coughs> hear scientists, when I hear people out there that try to, to explain in evolutionary terms about a world that you and I live in, a vast world, a universe that God is so magnificent, God is so great, God is so awesome. The incomprehensible God, as Isaiah 55, 9, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. You and I try to give an answer to all of these things. We try to unscrew the inscrutable. We try to assume that just because maybe we have a little bit of learning 
that we have become so intellectualized, scholarized in the world that you and I live in that we know so much more about life and we've got all of the answers when God says his ways are unsearchable. The depth of the riches of his grace is so unfathomable. David in the 139th Psalms made an appropriate comment. David said, such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high. He said in verse 6 of the 139th Psalm, I cannot attain to it. Now, if David were living today, he would probably just say this, that blows my mind. I don't know, what about you? It blows my mind when I look into the night skies and I see the twinkling of the stars that are out there thousands and millions of miles away and to realize that our galaxy is only one among millions that are out there. God is such an awesome God. But back to Job. If nothing else, the study of Job reveals that we do not fully understand God's ways. His ways are past finding out. We cannot explain the inexplicable. We cannot fathom the unfathomable. We cannot unscrew the inscrutable. If only Job's friends who had come to bring comfort, if they could have only understood that, if only you and I can understand that we do not know how to explain many of the inexplainable things that happen in this life. <coughs> if only Job's friends would have just acknowledged Job, I don't know why this is happening to you. Job, I can't even imagine. Job, I can't fathom all that you're experiencing, the grief that you've borne, the heartache of the pain in your life. Job, I can't even comprehend that, much less to be able to come up with something that makes sense on why you're having to deal with all of these things. Let me tell you, <clears throat> whenever you and I consider, as somebody said, God doesn't have a wonderful plan for everybody's life. Now, before you judge that too quickly, think about this, at least not here on earth for sure. <clears throat> Pardon me, for sure. Some lives are planned with people who have Lou Gehrig's disease. For some lives like Job's, some people's life is a life of pain. For others, it's a life of heartache and brokenness and blindness and paralysis or some kind of congenital complications as some kids are born congenitally with various things. For many, God's plan is no to their requests for healing. You will remember the Apostle Paul prayed for healing, and that didn't happen. But God said that my strength is made perfect in weakness. But you and I don't like that. We don't like that kind of thinking. There are lots of people in the world that won't even accept that. In fact, they will say, if you believe that, you lack faith. On the contrary, I believe if you believe that, you believe the Bible. For the God of the Bible includes the lives of people that did not get well. Not everybody got healed. Not everybody got over their problems or got over accidents or illnesses. Let me ask you a question. Go tonight to some of the vets around the world. Any of you ever watch those men and women that have fought for the freedoms of this nation? Have you ever watched them as they've walked down the halls of veterans centers or walked down the halls of hospitals where their legs have been blown off? Part of their faces have been disfigured by blindness. 
whenever I think about the people who have given their lives for that, and then I see where we are in America today and see what's going on in the world today. I don't know about you, but it makes my blood boil. Let me tell you, I still believe that America is one of the greatest of all nations that's ever been. It's the most benevolent of any nation in all the world. It's a nation that has been so blessed by God that we as Americans ought to be on our knees every day thanking God for the freedoms that we have and for the people that have fought and the people that have spilled their blood so that you and I can freely walk into this church tonight and worship with our convictions. Let me tell you, the God of the Bible includes the lives of people who don't get well, who don't get over their problems, who do not get over illnesses and accidents. God's Word pictures its heroes with all of the problems that are there. They hurt, they fall, they're frail, and by God's grace, they succeed. Go read Hebrews chapter 11, the halls of faith, as you look at those people. Bill Dad's foolish meanderings. Now, he didn't have a clue about God's inscrutability. We shouldn't be too surprised to hear as he continues with his philosophical ramblings. And then we come to chapter 25 verses 1 through 6, and we see his third round of assaults on Job. He begins by rehearsing some generalities that he has about God. What he says is true, but as usual, it doesn't bring any comfort or consolation to Job. Notice in chapter 25, verse 1, Then Bildad the Shuhite answered, Dominion and all belong to him who establishes peace in his heights, is there any number to his troops, and upon whom does his light not rise? How then can a man be just with God? Or how can he be clean who's born of woman? If even the moon has no brightness, and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less man, that maggot, and the son of man, that worm? Well, Pretty interesting. I don't know if you've ever been called a maggot. If you've ever been called a worm. I don't think any of us think too highly of some of those things. But let me give you these four observations and we'll pick back up here on Wednesday night. Four observations seem worth noting here. First, Bill Dad's third and his last presentation. We might just say, thank you, Lord. We're through with him. Secondly, this is the shortest chapter, chapter 25 in the entire book of Job. It contains only six verses. Third, it's brief, no doubt because there's very little left to say. And furthermore, by now, I would suspect that Bildad considered Job unteachable. And that's why he wastes his brilliant insights on the man. Or why, why would he waste them? But yet, he loved to hear himself ramble. And then fourthly, having run out of arguments, Bildad doesn't spend any more time attempting to prove Job wrong. He just simply lectures Job. This represents the last shot. He speaks first of God's power and greatness and then of God's justice. He speaks of man's sinfulness of what he's really doing here, he's just telling Job that God is all light and Job is all darkness. And that's why Job is suffering. His two concluding analogies that he uses is maggot and worm, and then he pretty much just wraps things up. And at various times, I don't know about you, but my heart goes out to Job. It's one of those times Whenever, if you can only imagine, and all the desperation that he's in, and all of a sudden to be called a maggot or a worm, I mean, that would probably create some uncontrolled anger with most people. Most people that use hurtful words, oftentimes, not always, they should 
they don't always apologize. And so Job is left here with all of the hurtful things that have been assaulted and thrown his way. And he has to deal with how he responds, how he reacts. And we'll pick up there on Wednesday night in Job chapter 26, verse 2. Would you stand as we pray together tonight? God bless you for being here. And I hope that as we continue our studies in the book of Job, that you and I will certainly glean from these things that they're just sometimes in life that we just have to let things be in the hands of Almighty God. When we don't understand, I can assure you, God does know. God knows the hurts. God knows the heartaches. God knows the undertakings that we're all challenged with. God sees our heart. God knows our feelings. And he's touched with the way we feel. Even though sometimes, sometimes it seems like God is so far away. In moments like that, he's never been closer than he is when we feel his distance and his silence.